I am AI. I am a creator, freeing our imaginations and breathing life into our wildest dreams. I am a guardian, keeping us safe on our way home. And wherever our curiosity takes us, I am a visionary, anticipating the needs of others. Simplifying our busy lives. I am a protector, keeping our most magnificent creatures out of harm's way. And helping our heroes make it home safely. I am a healer decoding the secrets from within and providing precision when every second counts. I am an innovator, finding smarter answers to complex tasks, working in harmony to lighten the load and driving perfection in everything we create. I am even the composer of the music you are hearing. I am AI, brought to life by NVIDIA, deep learning, and brilliant minds everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome NVIDIA founder and CEO, Jensen Huang. Greetings, Mobile World Congress. This is our first Mobile World Congress. We have a lot to tell you. Amazing things happen when breakthroughs in the communications industry meets breakthroughs in the computer industry. In 1995, Windows 95, 56K modem, and an Internet Explorer brought to us the Internet. Twelve years later, in 2007, extremely low power SOCs, cloud computing backed, digital wireless network came together to bring us the smartphone revolution. The iPhone wasn't the first smartphone. In fact, there were modems that were declared, uh, there were phones that were declared smartphones, including smart cameras, GPSs, IMUs, connected to a modem. But what made iPhone distinguished was that it was software defined. Because it was software defined, it was possible for application developers all over the world to upload and develop their own applications and host an entire service that ran the applications on a phone and connected to a service in the cloud. The fact that it had the ability to be software defined allowed developers of all kinds to create services and applications we never dreamed of. It disrupted every single industry. Books, music, videos, the way we order food, the way we travel, If you just think about the number of mobile devices that are in the world, and if we just estimated about $1,000 we spend on each mobile device, it's a $500 trillion industry. Extraordinary size. All because it was software defined. It wasn't the first smartphone, but it was the first smartphone that put it all together, became software defined. The application developers contributed 2.5 million applications. Two and a half million applications. Unheard of number of imagination, imaginative products created. If you take a look at this list, not only did it 
create new applications and change the way that we worked, disrupted entire industries. Products we used to use completely disappeared. Industries that we used to see completely disappeared. Created an enormous industry on top of this platform. It is now 12 years later. 12 years after Windows 95 was the iPhone, 12 years after the iPhone, a new era is beginning. In fact, the smartphone revolution is the first of what largely people will realize someday as the IoT revolution, where everything is intelligent, where everything is smart. This industry people have been talking about for some time, Internet of Things, where everything will become smart, where everything will become connected to the cloud, where everything will have a platform on top of it with imaginative services, and where every company, every industry, have an opportunity to have their iPhone moment. Twelve years later, we're standing at the beginning of this revolution. If you take a look at the things that we could do, we could make our lives easier, of course. We could squeeze a little bit more energy out of the power grid. We could extract a little bit more efficiency out of our transportation system. We could squeeze a bit more spectral efficiency out of our wireless networks. Each one of these industries are so gigantic that if we were able to squeeze another two, three, four, five, six, seven percent out of it, it is measured in trillions and trillions of dollars each year. The impact of bringing intelligence out to the edge is extraordinary. The fundamental difference this time, however, is unlike the smartphone, there's no intelligent person sitting next to most of these things. Most of these things are going to be autonomous. They have to sense, perceive, infer, and act by itself. They simply won't have the benefit of humans next to all of these things. And there are so many things. In fact, one of the, our beliefs is that eventually everything will be smart, everything that moves will be autonomous, and if that's the case, there will be trillions and trillions of things connected to the Internet. The fundamental problems are extraordinary. The vision is clear that everything will have the benefit of what is effectively an iPhone. However, getting there is hard. Since we're in Hollywood, I thought we would use this metaphor, the Infinity Stones, and it turns out we need exactly six. I don't know how they realized that, but we need exactly six miracles. And if we could find these six miracles and put them together in an effective way, we will be able to realize this amazing future of smart everything. This is our first Mobile World Congress, so maybe I'll take a second and introduce ourselves. We are a computing platform company. We pioneered a form of computing called accelerated computing, and we build computers to solve problems that normal computers cannot solve. We inter innovate and work in an area at the intersection of computer graphics, high-performance computing, and artificial intelligence. In the case of computer graphics, we're simulating virtual reality. In the case of high-performance computing, we're simulating physics inside a computer. In the case of artificial intelligence, we're trying to simulate human cognition. In each of these cases, NVIDIA is a simulation company. The processor we created is called a GPU. It is recognized as the processor that could extend the computational capabilities of some very important problems as we see now at the end of the Moore's Law. This is the intersection we play in, and we think we can make a real contribution to helping discover some of these gems. The first gem is something that we've been working on over the last close to a decade now, and we've dedicated an enormous amount of our resource to do this, is artificial intelligence. Modern AI started about eight, nine years ago, where researchers discovered that a new type of algorithm called deep neural nets, if fed with an enormous amount of data, it could hierarchically 
and systematically discover important subtle features inside a large amount of patterns, discover the patterns through a great deal of computation. And those patterns, it could apply to predict, to classify, to recognize the future. Deep neural networks has become so effective that almost every field of computer science has been touched, almost every field of science has been touched. We're working with companies all over the world. This is unquestionably the most important computer science event that's happened in the last decade and the most powerful technology force in our generation. In just a few years after its popularity, its discovery, this combination of using NVIDIA GPUs, processing large amounts of data, to discover patterns inside the data using deep neural nets, amazing breakthroughs have happened. In 2015, deep neural nets achieved superhuman levels of image recognition. And shortly after that, from language translation to speech recognition to speech generation and image generation to now superhuman levels of reading comprehension. Unbelievable progress in just a short period of time. When you combine all of these progresses, the applications that we can imagine are really quite daunting. Let me show you some of the crazy stuff we've been able to do with AI. They're just incredibly fun. This first one example is called Gauguin, and it's basically somebody who could doodle on the one side, and the artificial intelligence network will turn it into a photorealistic image. Here, a camera, a single camera, is able to look at an image and discover the three-dimensional pose of that person inside, and then project that three-dimensional pose into a three-dimensional world, because as you could see, it's in 3D. We were able to teach a neural network how to make robots stand, move, and in fact, do somersaults. And then we create a virtual reality environment where a robot could learn to be a robot and when it achieves that success, we move the software into a physical robot with a real computer, and amazing things happen as well. The robot does the same thing in the physical world that it did in the virtual world. We taught a neural network how to synthesize and generate three-dimensional information, three-dimensional environments, by looking at two-dimensional information. And so looking at a scene, is able to generate a 3D scene so that it's easier for us to label and learn from this 3D scene. We could go the other way and learn from a 2D environment all of the segmentation, the meaning of every single pixel. Purple is road, and blue is car. We could teach a neural network how to take CT scan and infer from it the different organs from a dust of blue points. And then, of course, we could put it all together to create a self-driving car, which is essentially a robot that senses, infers, and takes action. And in this particular case, in the application of self-driving cars. This is our self-driving car. It's our first robot. We call it BB-8. It's able to recognize objects, lanes, infer where best to drive, recognize its environment using computer vision, as well as radar, as well as LIDAR. And using all of these different sensors, infer from it with as much redundancy and diversity as possible so that this robot can be as safe as possible. So AI is making amazing progress. So the first two gems, our first two gems that we discovered, the first two infinity stones, artificial intelligence, and high-performance computing that's made possible by our GPUs. If you take a look at what's happening, the next amazing breakthrough is clearly 5G. You're experiencing it right here. The thing that's really interesting is that if we look at 5G, the incredible bandwidth that is achieved with millimeter waves, the spectral efficiency that we get from massive MIMO is going to, of course, make everybody's cell phone experience so much better. The interactivity on the web is going to be fantastic. We're going to just enjoy using everything that we have a little bit better. 
However, that only scratches the surface. The fact of the matter is, if we made all of our cell phone experiences better, it would be a wonderful achievement, but it surely wouldn't be revolutionary. 5G and the architects of 5G, the inventors of 5G, was so brilliant in thinking about all of the other new applications that we could create. Some of them are made possible because of this idea called ultra-reliable, low-latency connections. It is possible now for the network to be able to control and put a computer extremely close to the machine it has to operate because it's able to achieve that level of connection with extreme reliability as well as low latency. The other new capability that's made possible by 5G is called network slicing. Network slicing makes it possible for all of these services, different modes of services to be provisioned out to the public in different, size, different slices and make commitments of its service to people who are using the network in different ways. The potential, of course, is all of a sudden, we can connect these things to the network. And all these things are going to inspire new applications. The fundamental problem, of course, is that what used to be a phone, the cloud, and the telcos being essentially a pipe has to change. In this future, the edge can no longer be just a pipe. In this future, this edge has to be a computing platform. And the reason for that is very, very clear. Most of the applications that we will provision and the new applications that we will invent requires extremely low latency computation. It is not possible to go all the way to the cloud and back in several hundred milliseconds and provide for a safe operating environment if it happens to be a machine. It could be a self-driving car, it could be a shuttle, it could be a robotic arm that is working close to somebody that co cooperation capability is only possible if the latency of processing is extremely low. The second fundamental problem is the amount of sensor data that is going to be streamed across this pipe is going to grow incredibly. 5G is going to make it possible for us to connect up to 1,000 times more things than we currently do with 4G, from billions of things to trillions of things. Those things are going to be streaming sensor information that are going to be high density, high data rate, as well as continuous. Unlike the use of a phone, you use it when you need to access some information. In the case of robots, in the case of most sensors that are monitoring the world or interacting with the world, the information is streaming continuously. We simply can't afford to stream that amount of data over the network continuously and be able to operate most of these applications sensibly. And then lastly, there's just data protection matters. All of the data that is out in the edge and the point of action can't possibly be streamed, all of it, to the internet. And so these fundamental issues make it necessary for us to turn computation and put it into the network. This network today is built out of incredible gear that's made by the tel telecommunication industry for, of course, provisioning the data for security, for routing, all of that, all of that will have to evolve to the next generation. Just as the smartphone came out of a modem plus a camera, the next generation of computing has to evolve out of a data center which has communications, but in the future has to become software-defined. If it became software-defined, the number of applications we could host at the edge could be extraordinary. And do the same for the edge computing, that the iPhone did for the smartphone revolution. So we think that this center here, what is otherwise known as the edge, will become a computing platform in the future. It won't just be a pipe. And instead of dedicated equipment, that future will become software-defined high-performance computing. And it will be able to layer on all kinds of rich applications as a result. I think the iPhone moment, if you will, the smartphone moment, for edge computing is here. And a new computer, a new type of computer has to be created to provision these applications and make this vision possible. And so today we're announcing the world's first of this type of computer. We believe that in the future, in the edge, we'll need to be a high performance supercomputing edge server. It's optimized for processing sensor information. 
The sensor information could be video information, sonic information, LiDAR information. It is optimized for multimedia and interactivity with consumers, and it's optimized for artificial intelligence applications or robotics applications, where you sense, infer, and act at an instant. We call this computer the NVIDIA EGX. It's an edge computing supercomputer. It is powered by our state-of-the-art CUDA Tensor Core GPUs, GPUs that are the world's most advanced for artificial intelligence and computer graphics. It is secure from the base all the way to the top. From the moment that you boot this computer, it is secure. It's secure boot with root of trust. Everything is cryptographically encoded. Traffic inside the data center, traffic outside of the data center are encoded and decrypted and fully accelerated so it doesn't burden the CPU. Even the network, even the storage could be connected on the network so that a data center could be composable, disaggregated, and state-of-the-art. And all of the traffic that goes back and forth are completely secure, encrypted at all times. And then most importantly, the software stack. The software stack is the software stack that has taken the cloud computing industry and ourselves and all the developers thousands and thousands of man years to make possible. This is the same software stack that's running in just about every single cloud in the world. And this software stack makes possible high-performance computing and artificial intelligence. Inside are two processors that are absolutely state-of-the-art. There's the new NVIDIA CUDA, Core G CUDA Tensor Core GPU, as well as the new Mellanox Smart NIC. You can configure your computer in all kinds of different ways. You could have more than one GPU. With each one of the GPUs, you can select one of three. Some of it is extremely low, low power. Some of it is extremely great for computer graphics. Some of it is optimized for artificial intelligence. Depending on what you choose, you could have up to 240 trillion operations for AI processing. You could stream 140 HD video streams through this one GPU. And in a computer with four of these, almost 1,000 HD streams could be streamed. And each one of these streams will be decoded, image will be processed, you could do artificial intelligence on it, encoded, and stream it out again. Of course, it's based on our latest generation ray tracing GPUs, so computer graphics that are streamed from cloud gaming or augmented reality will be amazing. And it has 15, up to 15 trillion operations for our general purpose GPU called CUDA. All of this processing basically translates to one single node is equivalent to hundreds of CPU nodes inside a data center. The most important thing, of course, is the software stack. I've mentioned earlier, we call it the EGX stack, which is cloud native. It is secure from the moment that you boot to authenticate, attestation, the way that you stream networks, all of it's secure, and it's fully accelerated with our CUDA stack. It is, of course, optimized for all of the things that you would do at the edge, whether it's cloud gaming, augmented reality, image processing, sensor processing, as well as artificial intelligence. The NVIDIA EGX Edge supercomputing platform for this new generation of applications. We're really excited today to announce that Red Hat is joining us to turn this stack to convert everything that we're working on, integrate everything we're working on, and make it a carrier-grade stack. Red Hat, as you know, is the world's leading data center open platform, and they serve the world's, every one of the world's Fortune 500, and they, of course, has been an incredible service to the telecommunications industry. They're, they power and run 120 of the world's telcos today. So we're incredibly excited to be working with them to modernize to telco grade our stack so that we could provision Red Hat Kubernetes to all of the telcos. The rest of the IT industry has joined us as well. Every single computer maker, data center computer maker, the world's leading enterprise software makers have all joined us to take this platform to market. Add us. Dell, Fujitsu, Hewlett-Packard, Lenovo, 
QCT, Supermicro, Cisco, Microsoft, Red Hat, and VMware. So I'm super excited about this new platform. I want to thank all of our partners for joining us. Let's give them a round of applause. All right, let's take a look at what this can do. So this is the computing platform. We'll put this at the edge. We'll rack it up. It will replace hundreds of CPU servers. We'll be able to do AI in real time. We'll be able to stream sensor information of all different types. It is secure. It is cloud native. We'll be able to support sensors on a wide range of geographies, process information that is special geo, spatial, and temporally close to where you are, where the action is. Now the question is, what application do you develop on top? We have thousands of de developers that we're working with, but we thought we would create one particular application and open source it and give everybody a chance to see what this new type of application looks like, writing the, the first reference application. We call it the Metropolis IoT, and Metropolis is designed for sensors in smart cities. They could be smart cities, smart places. Um, it could be used in retail. It could be used in all kinds of different places where information is coming in at a very high data rate. In this particular case, we're going to have cameras that are, be, that are located on streets. These are real cameras located in real streets. And um, uh, basically, the stack works like this. All of this is streaming over Ethernet. It gets aggregated at a switch. Enormous amount of data is now streaming into our server. It comes in through our DMA. It's all completely secure in the data center, of course. It comes in through our DMA so that the CPU doesn't get burdened with so many streams of video at one time. We decode all of them. We can decode up to 140 of them. We have to do image processing on them. Maybe you, maybe you want to crop it. Maybe you want to, you want to change the color space. Maybe you want to take a fisheye lens and warp it back and de-warp it. So there's all kinds of image processing you have to do. CUDA is incredibly good at that. The deep neural network, the AI processing, now runs through our tensor cores. It could be one neural network, but it could be a whole bunch of neural networks. It could, you could, of course, you could detect, you could classify, you could track, you could estimate the pose, you could do all kinds of things in this framework. Every one of these neural networks are sitting inside a container, and those containers are provisioned by Kubernetes and orchestrated by Kubernetes. We can then pipe that through a graphics engine. You could decide to label it. You could decide to fill in the pixels. And then you encode it and stream it to the cloud. You could decide to, to encode it and store it locally. If there's anything that you detect, throw away the vast majority of the information. In the future, we're not going to record the Earth. We're not going to record all the things that are happening. We're only going to record what we need to record based on what we detected. And so based on what we detected, we might encode it. We might save it, stream it up to the cloud. Kafka is the streaming framework. Spark streaming allows us to do large-scale, resilient data analytics on streaming data. And then we would visualize it. This entire pipeline is captured in the Metropolis IoT application framework runs on top of the EGX server. This application is a miracle all practically in itself. You're basically doing all kinds of image processing in real time and then streaming it all the way out to the cloud. This is sitting in the Azure cloud where we're doing the analytics. Okay, so I'm going to show you this application step by step. And our goal, our goal in IoT is to authenticate the endpoints and so this system allows us to authenticate at a test that it, is, it should be allowed to send information. We would provision, deploy the neural network. We would then decide how we want to orchestrate it. Okay? So uh, authentication, deployment, we might decide to enhance it, and then orchestration. OK, so several step process. First step. So this is our authentication deployment. We're doing this live. So this is actually running on an EGX server. These are the live videos. There are 87 streams. We're detecting, running an a, a image recognition and classification model on top of that. We're doing that in real time. And these are, this is where the cameras are located uh, in the city. 
Okay, so we've now authenticated and deployed. Incredibly light application for this Edge supercomputer. The next step, we take a look at it, and we realize that, in fact, some of the models aren't working as well as we like. So we might decide to take this. All of our models are encrypted in a container. We also ship it to you so that you have a pre-trained model that you could decide to adapt using transfer learning. And we have transfer learning tools that you notice that, in fact, we could do a better job with this particular camera because maybe the camera space, uh, the location of the camera, the orientation of the camera uh, isn't as well tuned for the network that it's currently running. And we decide to optimize that. And we can do that and roll in the new camera, the new model, without turning down the computer, without taking down the computer, because everything is sitting inside a container. And we swap one container for the other container and direct DeepStream to now be looking at the second container, the new, the new model. It doesn't miss a beat. And so now we can enhance our model. We could decide then to deploy and scale it out. And so we've tried it in this many number of cameras. We could scale it out with a whole lot more. And this is all just running on one GPU. It's doing it fairly well. There's all kinds of new models you could decide to put into it. And of course, the goal isn't to just monitor. The goal is to find things. And so when we, when we set up these, uh, this network of cameras, uh, we, weren't, we didn't know exactly what we would find. Uh, but but uh, we recorded a variety of things. And whenever there are anomalies, it would detect it and store it. And so here's, here's one that, that we found. Let's see if you could detect the anomalies. I think that, that she thinks things that, that um, something's wrong. <laughs> and so she, she uh, got out. For, I would have stayed in the car, frankly. Um, and so, so anyways, uh, she's a great citizen. She, I don't know what she did with the information, but we, we caught it for her nonetheless. OK, so, so um, I, uh, the, the, world, the world has 40 million miles of roads. The world has 40 million miles of roads. And, and um, uh, the cities would like to put, put these cameras all over them so that, so that if, if there was an accident, um, if uh, a piece of furniture fell off somebody's back, back of somebody's truck, or a fender fell off, or a, 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 a tire um, busted, and uh, it's sitting in the middle of the road, uh, that they could alert somebody as soon as possible. So, so this, this type of application, this particular application, now makes those kind of monitoring and detecting anomalies uh, in the real world, a real possibility. Okay, so this is, this is Metropolis. Metropolis IoT is available uh, in our GPU cloud registry uh, as of today. Um, if you take a look at what, what Metropolis was doing, it was taking live video, it was sensing, it was inferring, it was perceiving, and it was taking action. And it was trying to do that as quickly as possible. In the case of a large number of cameras, we have to do that computationally extremely efficiency, efficiently because we're trying to keep the cost down. The more efficient the computation is, the lower the cost it is in provisioning these servers connecting to the number of cameras that we have out there. There's another type of application now. That was only one sensor. If we want to infer and we want to perceive the world better, we're going to have to have more sensors. The ability to have multi-sensor, or what the industry calls multi-modal AI, is extremely, po extremely powerful. So that what you hear and what you see, what you sense, and maybe even your a priori knowledge contributes to what you infer. Another way of saying context matters in intelligence. Well, we would like to create a multi-modal AI, and um, uh, this, is our, this is our first generation, and we call it the Jarvis SDK. You have the ability to do whatever you like with, to do with it. Uh, we create the open framework, the application, and uh, the, the, the models that are inside are pre-trained. There's several incredibly powerful AI models that are making this possible. 
speech recognition is state of the art. The natural language understanding model based on BERT is state of the art. Incredible breakthrough recently in conversational AI capability in the industry. Then from there, text to speech, and then speech synthesis. All of those models are running in the example I'm about to show you. It is all completely accelerated. It's running at the edge. And the reason for that is because there are so much sensor information, it's unlikely that we'll be able to stream all of that to the cloud. And so to, in order to use all of the sensory information to infer and to recognize what is happening and do uh, what is appropriate, uh, we're going to have to do this AI at the edge. We call it the Jarvis Multimodal AI. Let me show it to you. Hey, do you want to get some food? Yeah, actually, I'm pretty hungry. All right. Find us a Mexican restaurant. The nearest Mexican restaurant is Luna Mexican Kitchen, located at 1495 the Alameda San Jose. How's the weather in San Francisco? It is currently 66 degrees and sunny in San Francisco. Actually, you know what? I'm kind of feeling sushi. Really? Yeah. All right. Show us a Japanese one. The nearest Japanese restaurant is Aniki Sushi, located at 3810 Mori Avenue, Fremont. How about tomorrow? It will be mostly cloudy with a high of 62 and low of 54. What's the rating? Aniki Sushi has four stars on Yelp. That's pretty good. All right, show us the directions. Here are the directions to Aniki Sushi. Nice, I'm excited. I've really been craving sushi. Yeah, yeah, it's about time we eat. Okay, so take a look at what's going on here. And what you just saw, first of all, everything was running in real time. Okay, well, let's take a look at this. Hi, Jennifer. How can I help you? How much is that? The NVIDIA backpack is $100. What about the one on the right? The price of Hex tote bag is $120. How much is the white bottle? White Contigo bottle is $21. Is the black one insulated? Yes, black Contigo tumbler is insulated. What's the size of the center one? Rose Swell bottle can hold 15 ounces. Okay, great. I'll take that. Perfect. I'll charge it to your account. So if you take a look at what was happening, first of all, the reason here, there's literally one session of Jarvis running. It's able to recognize who is talking and therefore to question. Notice there was no hot word. Because it noticed who is making eye contact and who is asking the question. It also because it, it makes eye contact and remember who's asking the question, it could keep the contextual thread. Okay, just like when we're making a conversation with somebody, depending on who's asking the question, and, and oftentimes we get the question asked by somebody we're looking at. And so the ability to see somebody and recognize what they're asking and allows us to have a reasonable, intelligent, conversational thread. And so that's what's happening here. Notice how fast it was. If you're going to have a conversation with somebody, the ability to respond very quickly matters a great deal. In the future, it is very likely that we'll even be able to just interrupt each other in the middle of the sentence and have a fairly productive conversation between us and the AI. Notice here, it is impossible to understand what she's saying unless the AI could also recognize what she's pointing at. And so what's happening here is, uh, Recognizing the face, recognizing, uh, because at the end, she, the AI was going to charge it to her account. And so facial recognition matters. The ability to understand where she's posing, where she's posing and pointing at matters in 3D space, because that could be almost anywhere. And so it's important to recognize where she's pointing. And then to be able to classify and then answer the question, what is that object? so that they, the AI could recognize it and also understand the context of that object. Uh, probably because it's a bottle, it says something about how much fluid it could hold. Okay? And so in the future, these kind of multi-modal AIs will make the conversation and the engagement that you have with the AI much, much better. Now take this to manufacturing. Take this to manufacturing where you're working among robots and you would like to say things like pass me that or hand me that or hold this while I do that. Whenever you're using things like pronouns, he, she's, it's, and, th and that's, those kind of ambiguous words requires context. 
And the context could be part of either the domain that we're in, the conversation we're already having, or based on computer vision, what I'm pointing at. Something that I'm demonstrating through other sensations that I'm interested in. Okay, so multimodal AI. Let's go back to that, that slide, please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> So we call this Jarvis. It's an SDK, it's a tool, and it comes with pre-trained models. And these pre-trained models are, are accelerated. They're accelerated in the sense that they run on Tensor RT, and they run on our Tensor Core, and they're incredibly fast, so that you can have a conversation with it, so that you can run a whole lot of different AIs along with speech recognition, natural language understanding, text-to-speech and speech synthesis, computer vision, computer pose estimation. You're doing also classification. And then you've got to go figure out what is it that ultimately was meant. Go take the necessary action, which requires potentially more AI models, and then come back and perform the task or respond uh, to a question. Okay, so this is what Jarvis Multimodal AI is. It's an SDK. It comes with a whole bunch of pre-trained models, and then you guys could use it and uh, create some domain-specific application out of it. The SDK will be available in December, okay? And it runs on EGX. Well, this platform, this platform, uh, we've been building for some time, and we've been working with with early developers for some time. We've been working with early developers in smart city, in agriculture, in manufacturing, in transportation, in retail, and in call centers. If you take a look at the type of applications we can now address, it is absolutely gigantic. And most of these applications, these industries, are large. Half of the world's population live in cities. There are thousands of cities in the world that have a million people and more. 40 million miles of road that connects all those cities. 40% of the world's land mass is covered in farming. It is absolutely essential for all of us to find ways to improve the yield of farming, not to expand and increase the number of farms. There are already almost 600 million farms. Somehow we have to bring sensors and automation to the edges of those farms. Today, those farms, as you know, has no Wi-Fi, and you're not going to be able to put a person nearly at every single square acre of, of farm out there. There's two million factories. We can measure a lot of things, but you can't measure worksmanship. We can measure a lot of things, but you can't measure worksmanship. Scratches, small cracks, burrs, fit and finish, all of these things are impossible today. Finally, we have the capability to put this type of AI at the point of the factory and help the millions and millions of factory workers do better visual inspection. 10 trillion miles are driven each year. All of it is going to be autonom aut automated someday, either fully automated or auto-assisted. Those cars are going to be mapping the world continuously. Every single car is going to be a mapping car. We're going to be mapping, we're going to be streaming sensor information to the cloud over 5G. The data center close by will reconstruct the sensor information into a map, high definition map. It would update its memory of the map. Maybe some construction is being done. Maybe a new building got built. Maybe a new road got opened up. All of those roads in the world will be mapped in real time and continuously. Not every, part, not every car will contribute to mapping, but a lot of cars will contribute to mapping. All of that information will be streamed to the cloud. It will be processed at the edge cloud, and it will be streamed back to the cars. Millions and millions of stores, $30 trillion almost of industry, 13 million retail stores. If we could find just a little bit more efficiency, the quality of life would go up. Five million people are answering questions of all kinds around the world. These types of applications, for the very first time, we finally have the necessary technology to go engage. They're not going to get solved in the cloud. These call centers are unable to stream all of their data to the cloud because most of that data they want to keep local for either sovereignty reasons or privacy reasons or other competitive analysis, competitive advantage reasons. So all of these applications, as it turns out, would like to have computing at the edge. And we've created a new computer to help them do that. The early engagements that we're, we're working on are really quite amazing. 
There are hundred, over 100 partners of ours working on smart cities. There are already 4 million cameras in London. There is just impossible to, to scale that out because there's just not enough people to be looking at all those cameras. And so there's all kinds of companies that are cropping up all over the world to make every place safer. Manufacturing, I already talked about fit and finish. Samsung using it for, Samsung Electronics using it for um, the work that they're doing uh, in uh, inspecting semiconductors. BMW inspecting fit and finish, which is incredibly complicated. Foxconn for their PC boards. P&G, billions of people touch their products every single day. The quality of the product matters greatly. Keeping the manufacturing costs down and low is really important to them. And so visual analytics is going to transform uh, the way that we do visual inspection. Robotics. Robotics um, is particularly challenging. First of all, the AIs that I've spoken about are, are going to contribute to uh, enabling robots that will be able to work among us. Today, robots work either in large cages, if they're manu maneuvering quickly or lifting heavy things, or there are areas in the manufacturing floor that you're simply not allowed to cross. And if you cross it, instantaneously the robot stops. Okay, so the ability for you to coll collaborate and what is called cobots co uh, is limited because these robots can't sense what's happening around it. And so the first thing, of course, is we have to add sensory capability to the robots. And as a result, it could sense, infer, and act instantaneously. And because it can infer and act instantaneously, because it has a low latency connection over 5G to a data center that is the data center of the factory, for example, it could now manage and operate these robots with a great deal of precision and fidelity and safety. And so the thing that we have to do is, of course, we have to give this robot sensory capability, and then we have to teach these robots how to be robots. We have to teach the robots how to be robots. Teaching robots how to be robots is impossible by programming because we simply don't have the ability, the skills, to program the incredibly complex routines necessary for articulation. That's why AI is so powerful. The first step for us is to, number one, create the virtual environment that obeys the laws of physics so that this robot can learn how to be a robot. Then the second thing, we have to simulate the robot, let it learn to be a robot, and then number three, deploy it in the factory floor. We're going to show you a demo of something that works on the EGX. And so this cloud data center will not only be able to operate the robots, but it will create the virtual environments for the robots to learn how to be robots, create the AIs that let the robots learn how to be robots, and then lastly, deploy the operation on a large-scale basis operating on a large number of robots and letting them work together. And so Hamad is going to give us a demo of our first robot. OK, so what you're looking at right now is a virtual reality environment. This virtual reality environment looks real, and it behaves really. So according to, from the perception of this robot, it is essentially in the real world. Okay, so in this virtual reality world that obeys the laws of physics, that looks like, looks like the real world, we're going to let the robot learn how to be a robot. And so now step two. Step two. And step two, here we go. Okay, so here, Hamad is going to teach by showing the robot how to be a robot. Okay. So Hamad, you could see, he's using an iPad. However, he could be in virtual reality. And he says, robot, this is how I want you to pick things up. The robot's gonna perform tasks. Notice the brick obeys the laws of physics. It 
It recognizes the objects. Of course, it's going to have to generalize and diversify so that independent of where we place things, it will still operate like a robot in the future. Okay, not bad, not bad. Uh, Hamad, today. All right, and then now we trained a robot and we can now take the brains and replicate it into a whole bunch of robots. And um, these robots, of course, will have a sense of place. Uh, it will be able to recognize, detect and recognize objects. Uh, even if the objects are placed slightly off, uh, it understands what the mission is and it will, it will perform. And once, once we're done developing the robot, we take the robot brain, all of its software, and we deploy it into a factory of all of these robots and they would perform uh, the manufacturing task um, with us. Okay, these robots are going to be are going to be so acutely aware of its surroundings uh, that we could work uh, right next to them. Okay, guys, that's fantastic. Good job. Okay, so that's the Isaac SDK. It's going to be available in early January. If you're interested, reach out to us. And then lastly, Walmart. Walmart is the world's largest company. It's kind, of, it's kind of amazing to even fathom how large they are. Uh, they're they're uh, almost half a trillion. I think there are more than half a trillion dollars in revenues. 2.2 uh, million employees. And um, I think they, they, hired, they hired the entire size of NVIDIA uh, it, it, you know, by, three, by, by uh, 3 o'clock this afternoon. Um, and, um, and, and so, so uh, this company is gigantic. Uh, this is, this is um, they turned their New York lab uh, New York store, which is one of the largest Walmart stores, into an AI retail store, and it's powered by 400 GPUs. Every second, every second, Walmart in that store collects 1.6 terabytes of data every second. And what they're trying to do, what they're trying to do, is figuring out how to uh, help uh, customer service better, be make it easier for people to shop, uh, make sure that uh, they never stock out, make sure that all the products are fresh. Uh, make sure that they're, all of the products are the best priced possible. And so they're trying to enhance uh, the quality of the customer experience. And, um, and they have these, uh, these GPUs that power 400 GPUs is in, this, in this one particular retail store. And so the work that we're doing with them is really exciting. You, you know, as I mentioned, the retail industry is 27, almost $30 trillion large. There are 13 retail stores, not to mention the number of warehouses that it's backed up by and the incredibly complicated logistic supply chain that leads up to it. The opportunity for using automation to improve the efficiency of retail is extraordinary. And the retailers that we're working with all over the world are super jazzed up about applying AI in the retail store, in the warehouse, and how they manage their operations. If they could just squeeze out half a percent of economics from a $30 trillion industry, it is absolutely transformative to them. Uh, the level of engagement, the level of excitement that, that we're seeing out of, out of, uh, out of retail is, uh, is um, uh, not ours alone. And, and in fact, um, uh, our work with Microsoft uh, and our collaboration with Microsoft, we're seeing a lot of mutual interest in this area. And so recently we announced a partnership and Microsoft has ex adopted uh, the NVIDIA GPU to expand their Azure IoT offering. They're going to create these Azure Edge boxes, essentially computers like the ones that I just described to you, and they'll be located, they'll be put at the point, at the point of action, solving exactly the same problem that I just described to you with EGX. And um, their platform, the, I the Azure Cloud, um, the IoT, Cloud, the IoT Sphere, the a Azure Edge Box, and the NVIDIA ecosystem are going to dovetail each, each other perfectly, and then together we'll be able to uh, support and help these retail customers become uh, more powered by AI. Okay, 
AI, GPU, the revolutionary smart NIC from Mellanox that makes this box high performance, super secure from the point of booting all the way to operation and deployment, cloud native software stack that was made possible by Kubernetes and our partnership with Red Hat is going to be able to turn it into a telco um, certified and telco ready stack. The EGX computer that puts it all together. We're really still missing one stone. And that one stone turns out to be uh, incredibly challenging. Here, here's the thing. If you look at, if you look at the, the telco data center today, um, in order for this vision to be realized, and everything that I just described in front of you, the existing gear still has to be purchased. And the ability to get ready for this new future with all of these diverse applications require new computers to be purchased. This is one of those classic chicken or the egg problems. Is the killer app going to come first, and therefore we're going to go build our data centers to support it? Or do we build our data centers to support it, and then the killer apps will show up? And you know, my, my attitude about most of these things, because we're in the computer industry and we build computing platforms, is if you build it, they might not show up. But if you don't build it, they can't show up. And, and so, so we start the process of building these platforms. And we hope that at some point, some amazing breakthrough happens. Wouldn't it be amazing? if these cloud data centers were able to use exactly the same computer that they would use for cloud gaming, for AR, for artificial intelligence, for smart retail, for smart agriculture, for smart transportation, and it happens to be exactly the same computer for running the 5G RAN, so that everything in the data center in the future is software defined. Everything is just software running on top of the supercomputer. Well, it turns out that if you're able to do something like that, the ability for you to create a network of data centers to support the changing dynamic workloads and the changing dynamic traffic that happens very naturally, the utilization that will result is incredible. And therefore, when utilizations go up in a capital-intensive industry, the cost of the capital decreases. There is so much energy in wanting to make the data centers, the edge data centers, software-defined. There's so much energy in wanting to make tel telecommunications, wire wireless communications, software-defined. It is just an extraordinarily hard problem. And, um, but the benefits could be pretty extraordinary. Let me take it, let's just take a look at this benefit. And so, so before we run this, before we run this, this is from Todd Mosdak. He's, he's the CEO of a company called Omnisci. They deal with gigantic data. If you guys ever need to work on large data, go to Omnisci, tell Todd that Jensen sent you. And, um, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, they deal with data sizes that are just gigantic. And they do it like they, they treat the large data like a video game. And as a result, you can analyze uh, your data incredibly fast and find insight from it. Let's roll this really quickly, please. This is 2.7 billion rows of crowdsourced mobile phone data from our partner Tutela, running on the OmniSci GPU accelerated database and analytics platform. Now, let's zoom into New York and specifically, let's look at the financial district. We've circled just lower Manhattan on the map now. Check out this very tight workday usage pattern in the heat map, and look at the time chart here in the bottom right. See how usage falls off dramatically every night and all weekend. And all that activity has to shift to other places like Brooklyn. So let's compare these two areas. If we zoom out a bit so we can see Brooklyn, then shift the focus over there, we see a completely different usage pattern in those same two charts. More traffic in the evenings, more and steady traffic on the weekends. The data needs of the carrier don't go away. They just move and evolve both through place and time. So carriers need to be able to change and reconfigure to meet these needs without over-provisioning. So carriers need both high performance and software-defined infrastructure. Okay, so you could see that if, if the world of 
communications was also software defined. The ability for us to move the workload from one data center to another data center is going to be increased. Now, that ability, when you overlay on top of this, all of the other applications we're thinking about, unless we're software defined, is simply not going to be possible. And so we decided that wouldn't it be amazing if this platform was also a software defined 5G network that runs on our GPUs. Now, if we're able to su succeed in doing that, then this becomes the data center computer at the edge. It is exactly the same, data, same computer that I've mentioned earlier. It is offered um, off the shelf with off the shelf components. It is configured for all kinds of different use cases. You can run 5G on it, IoT on it. You can run XR on it. You can run 3D graphics on it, of course. And you can run all kinds of applications we haven't dreamt of. The entire software stack is, is cloud native. The entire software stack is cloud native. It's industrial strength. It's been tested by billions and billions of people up in the cloud. And the IT industry uh, supports it. There's just one missing ingredient. There's just one missing ingredient. We announced, we announced, we created an SDK that basically does the, th the 5G RAN physical layer in an SDK and software. It does the frequency modulation, demodulation, channel equalization and balancing. It does the error correction. However, there is so much knowledge in building 5G radios at scale. And um, I can't tell you how excited I am that the world leader in wireless communications has been secretly working with us <laughs> to create the world's first software-defined 5G RAN. Ladies and gentlemen, Ericsson. This is... And from Ericsson, I would like to introduce Frederick Yadling. Frederick! Frederick, Fre terrific. Thank you for being here. Frederick literally flew in from Sweden just a second ago. I think, I, think uh, uh, I was taking a nap, and it took me a while to, to amp up. Uh, you, you, were, you were actually on a plane. That's correct. Yeah, I took one of the last remaining direct flights from Stockholm to Los Angeles. So it was oh really my gosh. good to be here. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Yeah, yeah. Well, we've been, our teams have been, have been secretly working on this project. And, and, and I mean secretly, not, not because there's, there's uh, any particular secret, but because we didn't realize it could be done. No. And so some of the world's best computer scientists, some of the world's best wireless communication experts have been working together on top and creating essentially this stack uh, we called in our company, we call Aerial, which stands for antenna, mm. uh, the stack that um, uh, would, would be the foundation yeah. for Ericsson to create essentially a 5G, 5G RAN. Yeah. So my first question for you is, is uh, you know, we've been, the industry has been talking about software-defined uh, communications and yeah. software-defined uh, data centers. Yeah. And this is, this is a, a, an area that is of extraordinary interest, yeah. and, the, and the technology has been complicated. Yeah. You know, w from your perspective, what do you think, what do you think took so long, and, and um, what do you think about the moment that we're in and, and the implication to the future? Sure. Uh, let me shed some light on that. I, I think we've been, um, we've been uh, a long history of building mobile networks for the past, let's say, 25 years. Everything from 2G to 3G to 4G and to 5G, and up until now, I think it's all been about person-to-person -person communication via mobile handsets. Uh, and uh, 5G... Does everybody know that all the Bluetooth you guys use was invented by Ericsson? Okay, That's all right. That's true. Keep, keep going. Just, no. <laughs> <laughs> no it's, just, it's kind of mind-blowing, actually. No, but the, the heritage of this company is really quite, quite yeah, extraordinary. It, it, no, thanks for that. And uh, by the way, very impressive presentation here Thank as well you. before. And I think... Uh, uh, look, 5G we designed for something else. It was not only to connect people with each other, but it was connect things with, each other, with, with, uh, with things uh, and uh, people with things. Uh, and then you get into a different uh, challenge of, and you get, then you get into a broad environment. You know, get into more of an IT-oriented environment. Then you've got to be able to leverage a broader ecosystem, it being SDN, it being uh, COTS-based hardware, mm -hmm. uh, it being uh, whatever it might be, virtualization. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an industry, we've been um, 
in all honesty, struggling to find uh, alternatives that are, uh, that are better or more higher performing uh, than our current, uh, current uh, sort of bespoke environment. Mm -hmm. uh, now, over the past and year... And when you mean bespoke for everybody, it's literally meaning hundreds of the world's leading wireless communications experts designing ASICs. Exactly. And these exactly. ASICs are incredibly complicated. Yeah. 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 And now we have figured out a way to then explore together with NVIDIA how we can uh, define the next generation of, uh, let's call it VRAN, utilizing the GPUs mm -hmm. that you're producing and combine it with our many years of uh, wireless technology knowledge. And they build something that is powerful and flexible for our customers. Uh, we have to understand our customers, the mobile operators, service providers across the world, they are looking for uh, different architecture, enabling them to take advantage of 5G. Our collaboration is figuring out uh, an efficient way of providing that, again, combining the GPUs mm -hmm. with our heritage. Now, now of course, the, the world's going to stay hybrid for a very long time. Sometimes, sometimes a, a DRAN is perfect. Yeah. It's the ideal exactly. solution. Sometimes a, a, um, a dedicated system uh, sitting in CRAN is the perfect yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. And because because the, that particular data center or service provider isn't offering a whole bunch of other applications yeah. and they want to be incredibly world class yeah. and as cost efficient as possible yeah. Yeah. at delivering one thing. Yeah. And, and, and yet there will be some that would like to provide a whole bunch of applications that sit yeah. on top. Yeah. You know, the thing that's, that's really quite amazing is, is um, uh, if you take a look at the, the people that, that ultimately uh, uh, realized um, that this, the timing was now and that you create, that created the, uh, uh, the 5G RAN that sits, sits on top of our GPU. You have to realize that we're using a GPU that is powering the world's fastest supercomputer. Mm. It is the most advanced GPU in the world, the single largest processor in the world. Mm. And it took the world's best computer scientists and algorithm experts working on top of that platform to make it possible. Mm. Mm. And so now, now that we, we, uh, we realize that it's possible, mm. uh, the thing that's really quite exciting is, is um, uh, the, the rate of innovation of, of NVIDIA GPUs is so fast mm. that we'll be able to take the hardware system cost down as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. and, mm. and then there'll be other, other applications mm. that we could mm. layer on top of it. Mm. Uh, the type of algorithms that your researchers are already imagining yeah. as a result of, of um, AI and uh, high-performance computing at yeah. the edge is, yeah. is just incredible. And that's what we're looking at beyond then, of course, the GPU collaboration on the baseband side. It's more around the, your capabilities in AI and capabilities in supercomputing and apply that across. So that, that's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting thing. We, we actually, it's about, we launched, the people don't know that maybe, but we launched 5G a year back here in the U.S. Uh, with the first 5G network. So it's been, it's been, uh, uh, it's been around for a year, which, uh, which is a life length in many of these technologies. But uh, uh, we, we, we're currently around 34 networks across the U.S. and uh, very proud to be part of the U.S. market here. And uh, we, of course, run a lot of use cases ourselves and see what, what 5G can and some of them were shown here. Mm -hmm. uh, we are deploying a, a factory here now which has exactly that uh, kind of automated manufacturing facility by 5G, mm -hmm. utilizing the low latency networks to uh, dummify the robots, making sure you've got the intelligence out in the cloud with low latency, so you can manufacture in a far more efficient way. Mm -hmm. And by the way, also manage the fleet straight out to the site, etc. So we try to we try to drink our own cool Kool Aid, and uh, uh, this is a very important uh, market for us. Yeah. It's funny you should say that. I, I we have a robot simulator um, that I just <laughs> that we'd love to work with you guys on. <laughs> It'd be great to have a whole yeah. bunch of Isaacs, uh, um, uh, you know, doing some doing some amazing tasks in your in your factory. You know, the thing that the thing that I'm super excited about. And, and, and I, I, I think this is our first time when we met. Uh, you know, we, we, we fantasized and dreamt about, uh, about the future of, of uh, uh, telecommunications and uh, an industry that, that, that um, uh, with each, every generation, enabled a revolution uh, in computing. And, mm -hmm. and when, I met, when I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the, the, the Windows 95 and, and the 56K modem, mm -hmm. uh, the iPhone would have been possible if not for data wireless mm -hmm. data networks. Uh, and then now with the 5G networks coming, the the the, the thing that I'm I'm incredibly excited about is is um, uh, all of these data centers and all these points of access mm. uh, around the world that that is powered, mm. and where where the computation can now be placed closer to mm. where the point of action, the yeah. point of data, yeah. can be, and and the opportunity for this industry uh, to uh, sit on top of uh, the platforms that you guys create. Yeah and that we create together, uh, th that there'll be an application world that yeah. sits on top yeah. of this. Yeah. 
and and um, and that's ultimately the the reason why we make something software defined, yeah. so that so that people could invent applications we never thought of. And we we, we see it the same way. The five D is a platform for innovation, and yeah. uh, I think we just started to see the beginning of it. But uh, what can be done with this is uh, enormous for us as well. Yeah. So today today we we are not quite ready to show you. Uh, the results of our work. We just wanted to let you know that, that the world of 5G RAN is coming, uh, VRAN is coming, and um, uh, we're, we're, in, we're incredibly honored and delighted to partner with you guys and, yeah. and uh, to uh, partner with the people that, that uh, write, the, write, the, write the books on teaching us about wireless communications. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, you guys write the books on, on, on 5G. Uh, we write the books on computer graphics. Yeah. And uh, so, so you're looking at two companies that apparently write a lot of books. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> and so, Thanks a lot, Jeff. Frederick. Really thank you very much for coming. Thanks for inviting us today. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Guys, Frederick Yateling. Uh, I'll just make one announcement about about Sweden. If you guys have not been to Sweden, uh, absolutely go. Uh, you know, around summer, and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I spent two continuous days drinking, and um, I, I took, I t then it took me two months uh, to recover. Um, but but uh, Sweden is one incredible place. Uh, I, I would characterize it as delightfully strange, De delightfully uh, lovably strange, and so uh, really really amazing people. So uh, Ericsson and Nvidia working on a 5G VRAN on NVIDIA GPUs. And so that's, those are the six miracles. Those are the six miracles. AI, GPU for extremely fast computing, the networking technology from Mellanox, the security technology from Mellanox that is able to do it all at data rates, line speeds, the fact that we now have the ability to have an operating system, an orchestration system that allows us to deploy quickly new applications in small environments, small computers, to manage a large fleet of systems, not hundreds, not thousands like most companies, but trillions of devices in the future, and to be able to update them, orchestrate the service with very light touch in one pane of glass, a system that is created that integrates all these great ideas, built for the very first time, designed to be an edge computer, and then lastly, the work that Ericsson and ourselves are working on to virtualize the 5G radio. As a result, what you're looking at is essentially the six miracles that are gonna make it possible for us to put AI at the edge, to virtualize the edge data center, and to enable this new world of smart everything. And so those are the six miracles. Let's take a look at what we can do. And so these are some of the fun things that we can do. I'll go show you a couple more. This is, uh, the next one is cloud gaming. Okay, imagine if we could play amazingly beautiful games from everywhere. And in order to do that, latency has to be low. We have to compute this at the edge. What you're gonna look at right now is running over 5G. This is only running over 5G and a data center miles away, okay? And so because of the low latency capability of 5G, we're going, to be able to en we're going to be able to enjoy games, amazingly beautiful games, running on these EGX systems from anywhere. All right, who's coming up here? David, is that you? All right, so you brought yourself a 5G phone, and this is a 5G phone. You connected a little peripheral to it That's so right. that you could enjoy the game. And uh, let's see what you can do. And this is running over the 5G network, Verizon's 5G network locally. All right, let's take a look. All right, you guys, what you're looking at here, what you're looking at here is a game on a phone. This is a game on a phone. Frankly, this makes no sense. This is a game on the phone. Dave is one of our employees. He's one of, one of our most senior software leaders. He's extremely good at playing video games. <laughs> and that's what I pay him to do.
What do you guys think? This is incredible, right? All of these, all of these, um, all of these servers will have to be put near the edge. You would like, you would like um, uh, the latency to be as low as possible. And with the low latency inherent in 5G, we're going to be able to just deliver every, every, every genre of video game to the phone wirelessly. Okay, David, good job. Hey, show, show us you. your replay. How, how did you do? How did you do? Hang on a second. Let's, this, this is David. You know, it always looks good, first person view, and then you look at it among the other cars, and then you realize what a terrible driver you are. <laughs> you almost bumped into that guy right in front of you. You could pick David out pretty easily. He's the guy that's driving, he's all over the road. <laughs> he, I think he's the Ferrari. It looks so much faster when you were driving, huh? Yeah. You got a glare there, sir. Amazingly beautiful video game. All right, you guys. Good job. Thank you. Yes. And so we have, we have a service called GeForce Now. And the way that we work is we partner with telcos around the world so that we could place these servers, these EGX servers, that I mentioned earlier that's running an application we call GeForce Now. And we have great partnerships all over the world. LG U Plus in Korea, uh, Ross Telecom in Russia, SoftBank in Japan, Taiwan Mobile in Taiwan, Telefonica in Spain. And we're putting the service and these servers in these data centers in these countries so that people can enjoy cloud gaming from anywhere. These servers are gonna be precisely the same servers that will then run AI for intelligent agriculture and intelligent retail. It'll be the same server that provisions the 5G VRAN. The future is software defined. And these applications, these low latency applications that have to be delivered at the edge can now be provisioned at the edge on these systems. Let me show you one more application. And this one's augmented reality. Augmented reality, of course, uh, has, has uh, has really has really come into um, come into the world recently with uh, applications and, and great games like Pokemon v AR, and so you could you could uh, chase a Pokemon all over the city. Uh, this level of AR is only only doable if you have a powerful computer, and this is used for industrial design or this is used for professional graphics. And so what we're going to show you now is extreme augmented reality. Okay, so if you can see this, as you could see, that car's on the stage. You guys are in the background. It looks like it's on the stage. And um, Rosalind's going to help us inspect this car. Okay, so take a look at look at what. What Rosalind sees, you see a car. This is on Rosalind's phone. Let's zoom into it. I want to see, you know, look, if I'm going to buy this car, this McLaren, I think, goes for a couple million dollars. I'm going to want to see some of the detail. Look at that. Don't shake. Don't move. Dude. Don't shake. Keep your core tight. <laughs> Hold your breath. Look at that. Look how beautiful that is. Unbelievable. Well, let me go inside. Show me inside. That's so beautiful. Frederick is going to place an order here pretty, pretty soon. I can see him eyeing it. That's a good looking car, Frederick. You and I can both get one. Look at this. Can you see, can you feel the leather? Can, can you feel the, look at the steering wheel, the leather on the steering wheel. Can you see it? So amazing amounts of detail. All right, you guys. 
extreme augmented reality. You know, one of, one of the things that, that um, uh, with Windows 95, we consumerized 3D graphics and video games became 3D. Uh, with, the, with the smartphone revolution, computer vision became consumerized. If you take a look at the modern computer vision technology that's in most phones, uh, the capability is really quite amazing. It has to detect and understand the surroundings, register itself to the surrounding, track itself relative to the surrounding, its pose, send that information, in this particular case, sends that information to a data center with the EGX server there, which is running an incredibly complicated computer graphics application. It takes that pose information, it renders the world within that pose, it sends the data back to the phone. And that's what you guys were seeing. So Cloud XR is the name of our Cloud XR is the name of our SDK. It's available today. It works in both AR mode as well as VR mode. It allows you to take your head mount display and its pose information or your phone, its pose information, stream it to the cloud, renders it, sends it back. It's all perfectly registered. Okay? And so now uh, whether you're in industrial design or uh, in entertainment or whatever whatnot, uh, you can enjoy um, virtual reality and, and augmented reality in real time. All because we now have a data center that is powered by the EGX and the low latency of 5G. Cloud XR is available today. So that's it. What we announced today was a brand new computing platform. We call it the NVIDIA EGX Edge Supercomputing Platform. It's made possible by the combination of several new technologies. Our advanced Tensor Core CUDA GPU that does AI, ray tracing, incredibly great computation. The latest generation Mellanox Nix that does security processing, secure, secure boot. It protects data in motion and data at rest. This is one incredibly secure computer. It is built on top of a stack that is industrial strength for the cloud, industrial strength for AI. We have a partnership with Red Hat to make a telco core ready. We have a partnership with Ericsson to create one of the most important applications for the future of data centers, the 5G VRAN. Because of it, we can now really mobilize ourselves. We have that one killer app to start installing these servers and let the applications come to us over time. We have several applications we've already built to stir up demand and to bring application out to the edge, GeForce Now, as well as Metropolis IoT. Metropolis IoT is available today. It's open source. You could download it. You could modify it. You could use it for smart retail, smart agriculture, smart manufacturing, smart cities. And then we have a partnership with Microsoft that's going to take this platform and theirs together out into the world of intelligent edge because we see so much demand for it. And so... This, we believe, is going to be one of the pillars, the foundation to starting the smart everything revolution. I want to thank all of you guys for coming today. Thank you.